Hey, Senda. Hey, Phil. I believe we have some unfinished terms to define. Oh, unfinished business? <laughs> Us? Never. Cue music. <laughs> And welcome to another episode of Pandas Talking Games. I am your host, whose kids still have two weeks left before they have to start school, Phil. And I am your other host, whose child started school today. Oh boy. You say your Senda. name. Senda. There you go. <laughs> yes. It's going to be one of these nights for me where I'm barely... Verbal. That's what it I'm is okay. For. The words keep fleeing from me. <laughs> I am here to help, and I'll prompt you along the way. You will have to help me with many words. Anyway, yes. things we should say really quickly. This continues to be a pandemic pandas episode, which means that I'm not editing it. So and you're going to hear. We didn't write it. <laughs> we didn't write it. So you get to hear exactly how foggy I am from the like high anxiety going into this week. Um, and it'll be fun. <laughs> right? Yes. So to address a few things, since I brought it up at the beginning, beginning of the show, um, yeah. your kiddo uh, did start school today, but uh, you are in uh, you are in virtual school. Yes. Yeah, okay, it's all so, virtual. So right, your so, high anxiety is just the how is this going to work anxiety, not is yeah. my kid safe anxiety. Like you, yes. you insured the second one. You just yes. have to like, how is this going to work? Yeah, every single class has been a new experience of how do we get logged in? Um, you know, where do you find the stuff? Right. <laughs> All of the things. <laughs> which is anxiety, which is anxiety ridden enough, but you know. Right. Could be- it is not, it is at least not like you know, you know, what is the air circulation like in this classroom that he's in? Um, how many people has he been exposed to over how long of a period of time? Right. Correct, correct. I, I'm not I'm not worried about those things. And I'm very glad that I'm not. And I do feel like, you know, and I will just I will just state this right. Like, I know that I'm very privileged to have been able to make the decision that my child could attend school remotely um, and to have been given that option by the school district. Right. Yeah. That um, he's attending simultaneous classes. Um, with people who will be in person in a weird hybrid alternating way, right? Um, so I know that that's very privileged. I do think that it was basically my responsibility, both for my family and my household, to make that decision for him, um, for all of us to be as safe as possible. And then on top of that, there are definitely kiddos who can't stay home and whose parents don't have jobs and stuff that will allow that. And I also think that it's important for me to have made that decision to keep um, extra people out of that classroom, both for, you know, trying to keep the teachers as safe as possible and the other kiddos as safe as possible. Like, the fewer people that we have in those classrooms who need to be there, I think the better the better we do, right? I'm 100% with you. That was actually the exact same reasoning behind um, the decision to put my kiddos in virtual uh, school as well. Fortunate enough to be able to do it, as well as... Um, doing our part to keep the numbers down in the school. Right. Yeah. Because so. I can do it, I feel like I should. Yeah. Um, I mean, and to be honest, it's more work. It's more stress. Yeah. Um, yes. But, that and was, it would be... You know, every 45 and, minutes during my work day, it was go log into a new class today. Yeah. I mean, and it would be easier <laughs> to just not, um, like just, you know, it would be ideal to just send them back and be able to just, you know, sure. But that's great. not where we are. Anyway, no. um, these are the these are our pandemic days. These are our pandemic episodes. Um, and we're going to pick up where we left off last week with our uh, defining some terms. So yes. last week we defined a handful of terms. This week we had um, we had leftovers. That we didn't get to, and the terms are still good enough. Like we looked at the ones left over, and we're like, "No, this is totally show worthy." Eh, we'll just keep I, going. I suspect next week we'll do something different uh, because yeah. we don't actually have any more terms. The the one we'll probably well, finish the ones we, can, we get through, and yeah, if we and then, don't, we probably yeah, just we'll do we'll wait still, till we build up. We'll some save more. them up. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so if you have more terms or anything that we miss, because we were kind of making some uh, stabs at words that we say lots. Um, and we totally could have missed some things. So if you've jumped in more recently and you haven't, you know, heard us 
defined some of this stuff a million times, and that's totally fine and cool. Uh, just drop us a note and uh, let us know what you would like to hear us talk about in yeah. like a better descriptive way, right? Instead of just dropping it into a conversation and we will write it down and probably do some more of these in the future. Now, yeah. the fun part is that uh, last week we had 10 and then we did uh, six of them. And then this week we added two more to what was left. So we have six. So last week is rolling a D10. This week I am rolling a D6. Roll a D6. <laughs> Roll a D6. DM, DM says, says you're, you're gonna, gonna die. die. Roll a D6. Are we ready? Yeah, I'm ready to roll. Are you ready? I am was ready there, to roll. Was there as anything well. else that we needed to I say? I do not think so. Okay, good. I'm gonna roll. Okay, number four: consent, affirming, and revoking. Oh, fantastic! Good uh, one. So these are terms that we use, and and I say we because I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we're the ones who started saying this. I'm not, I mean, other people probably did too, but I, we have been very clear about this um, in terms of talking about safety tools. Instead of talking sometimes, sometimes we talk about specific safety tools, right? X card, lines and veils, things like that. Sometimes we talk about them in the terms of the mechanism yeah. that they perform. Um, and in this case, the, these two terms are a, a pair Consent yes. affirming and consent revoking. And they are exactly what you think they are, right? So uh, consent affirming means to give consent. Um, and this would be a tool that in game would um, give consent or reaffirm, right? So could give consent yeah. again about right. something that's going on. Ongoing confirmation of consent, right? Because yes. so we got to talk about consent and, and we've talked about it a lot on this show, actually, but we got to talk about consent as an ongoing thing that can be revoked at any time. And because it is an ongoing thing that can be revoked at any time, you are actively giving it all the time. And when the situation changes in some way, you should be able to actively affirm that you still enthusiastically con consent to yes. the situation that you are now in in the game um, in. Yeah. So, so that's it's a way for you to um, to actively affirm that you are still consenting, and the way that it usually comes up in play for me is um, is actually when I know I'm changing the scene, um, you know, in some big way or or even some small way. When I'm making a shift to what we thought the scene was going to be or how it was negotiated, um, I like to then like a firm consent from someone, which is a little bit more complicated. I want to know that that consent is still, still present. present. Yep. Right. Even though I've made a change to where we thought we were going or where we thought the scene was going or the intensity is ratcheting up. Right. Um, all of those things I want to know um, because we can reel it back. Right. If, if, if that goes beyond consent, then cool. Like let's not. Then that would to. be the other tool. Yes. Which so is the other consent, one is <laughs> sorry. consent revoking. Consent revoking. Um, I have feelings about these. Well, consent revoking then removes consent from yes. in, from what's going on in play. Um, and I, I think it's important to note, and I, I will say this, we have a nice write-up when we uh, eventually uh, put out Turning Point. We have a really nice write-up about um, some points about consent. And so one of the ones I will say right now is like, consent is not a movie ticket. Right. So you don't hand it in at the beginning of the game, rip it, and then the consent lasts for the entire game. Right. Yeah. It, it's not a like we we often will set up consent at the beginning of a game. But like you said, consent is a moment to moment um, thing. And it it while you can initially set it at the beginning of the game, um, you can change it at any time. And so what these two tools do is they check it. They check that ongoing consent, right? Consent affirming tools will basically say, oh, no, no, that consent we set up originally, still good. Still good. Mm -hmm. Right? Keep going. And the consent revoking will be like, oh, that consent we set up earlier, not right now. Yep. And, 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 we'll, and then we can, you know, then we can deal with that. Like when consent's revoked, we can deal with what to do with that. Mm-hmm. Which is sort of a separate conversation in and of itself, but but that that is what we mean when we talk about consent affirming and consent revoking in terms of safety tools. Um, there's you know we, we can make a list 
of, you know, safety tools that fall into both categories, right? It's probably worth giving an example of, of each of them. So sure. the most common consent revoking tool is the one that everyone knows, which is the yeah, X card. The X card. That is a consent revoking tool. Yeah. Yep. It's um, there is a flip side if you want to use just straight up comparable, right? There is a flip side to the X card that you can use called the O card. Um, I don't see it used very often. It, it's not it's not used very often. Um, I have seen it in a few places, but again, I've not it's not as prevalent. Um, the other places you will see it is um, in the consent uh, flower, the support flower, mm-hmm. right? The red, um, the red petals are consent revoking, and mm-hmm. the, the green ones the in green the middle. One. Yeah. Consent or is affirm. it green on the outside? I, I, no, I think it's green in the middle. Okay, and then yes, and those are consent affirm. Maybe it's the other way around. It's been a the while colors, since I looked at one. The, the colors, colors are correct. Are correct. Yes. And Red the wording on the stop. pedals, the wording on the pedals are also like, Correct, like you yes. won't mistake it. If if yeah. we're remembering it differently, here's what I do know: the middle pedals are or are yellow. Yellow, yeah. <laughs> I just don't remember <laughs> which <laughs> one's which, but I know those middle pedals are they're yellow. Yellow. <laughs> I actually think it's green on the outside, red on the inside. Is it green on the outside? I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. Anyway, but you know, green means get to go, and red means stop. He's going to look right. it up now. Um, I mean, case, the other one, point being, the other one then, that we like to talk about um, that we have talked about a bunch is um, the OK check-in, which is a tool um, that's used in LARP a lot, um, which is a series of hand gestures, um, one of which thumbs down is basically, you know, the X card consent revoking, one of which thumbs up is your consent affirming. Um, what I really like about that particular tool that I think is somewhat missing in terms of when we talk about other consent affirming tools is the ability to ask for that feedback as the person who's making a change, right? So that's one thing that's um, different about that particular tool, which I really like because as the person who's doing something, I can I can ask do I still have consent, right? Silently without interrupting the game. I love that. Anyway, that's me. Safety tools. <laughs> yes. By the way, yes. it's red in the middle. It's red in the middle and <laughs> green on which, the outside. Which actually makes sense because one, um, it looks like a flower then. It's like leaves, petals sure. in the center. Sure. Sure. Um, and yes, and um, I guess the other way to look at it is the green ones are on the outside. So like a very small gesture if it's sitting in front of all of you, right? It's a very small gesture just to hit yes. Yeah. Right. And, and then bigger it's, and, and, and I mean that as in, um, if I have to hit no, it's more obvious to, you know, like I'm People reaching. People will see it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's, I don't. I don't know if that plays any role in it. Anyway, the point being is that the takeaways from this are, um, consent is an ongoing activity and that, um, having, so, A lot of games will just have the consent revoking tool. That's nice. Um, So it assumes that consent is okay until it's not. What's really nice about a um, consent affirming tool is that when coupled with the consent revoke tool is that you have uh, the ability to like make sure it's okay. Yeah. Now, in the absence of it, you have to just ask. Like, yeah. Is everything okay? Are we still good? Which you can totally do in a game. Like, just because you don't have a tool for it doesn't mean you can't check in and and do it. But what's really nice is when you have those two tools kind of working together, um, it allows you to kind of keep the flow of the game. And that's the thing we've really always enjoyed about the OK check-in is that we could be having a really in-depth conversation as character. And without breaking character, I can just put up the OK to make sure yep. you're okay where the scene's going. You've given me the thumbs up and without missing a beat, we're staying in that dialogue. Right. But as opposed affirmed, to we've affirmed consent and exactly. you don't have to be scared that where you're going is going to make me throw a consent revoke at you. Exactly. That you're not, you're not headed in a direction that I'm concerned is going to hurt me. Right. Yep. Because that's what we're really talking about. Right. Which anyway. is why uh, just one last thing, which is why yes. I will always say, at the bare minimum, have a consent revoking tool, right? At the bare minimum, yeah. have a have a circuit breaker that you can flip in case anything goes off the you know off the tracks in your game. But really, I really really like the two. Um, I like the two paired together. 
Right. And there's there's parts of that conversation that we can have um, where people do have, and, and I, sh- I feel like we should mention it. I have heard concerns about consent affirming tools because um, they can give an impression of peer pressure that makes other people who might not be comfortable with stuff um, be able to see at the table like these people are having fun and I don't want to interrupt it. Um, this comes back around to me in terms of the okay check-in because that's calling for an immediate check-in on like the temperature of like the table as a whole, right? Um, which is less of a like, it makes it less of a like, well, I don't know, how did they answer? Now I'm going to judge my answer based on theirs. <laughs> like, um, But uh, we shouldn't spend the whole time on no, this. No, We've talked about okay. safety a bunch. But I, I like, just, that's, oh, that's the say, brief thing. Okay, yes, but i got to say, say one, more, one thing. more thing now, now one that you said your thing. I, had, right? I have so, to say it because it's a thing that I know is floating around out there. Nope, it's fine. I yeah. think what it, so I think that, so first of all, I'm going to firmly stand by consent affirming. But I think what it is, what it reveals is that what we fail to do or have not done a great job of is how to build a culture of safety into our games. Yes. If if we build a better culture of safety in our games, then people will have, they won't, they hopefully won't have the peer pressure of checking in and saying like, eh, I'm not like, I'm not okay with this when everyone else is right. But that is that peer pressure is a thing where you devalue your personal safety Uh over the safety of the group. When a good culture of safety says, um, every one of us is the one of us is as important as all of us. And if one of us is uncomfortable, then then this, the the group is uncomfortable. Right. It, it comes down to something that I usually like to say when I introduce safety tools at my games, which is that um, the, the safety of every individual um, at the table or the comfort, the, you know, the being okayness of every individual at the table is more important than the game or the story or anything else that we're doing at the table. Yep. Right? And, and it's, and I love that we, and I say the same thing, right? I love that we say mm-hmm. that where I think that there is more territory to be explored and more work to be advanced is how do we, how do we create a culture of it so that yeah. all the times when we game, we all believe that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Anyway, cool. now yeah. I'm done. Now you're done. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> cool number five i'm just gonna start singing these like the dual song yes. <laughs> i don't remember which one number five is do you remember it's like uh it's like it's like bring something, the doctor or something like it's, and have him face the other way so you can have yes. deniability yeah okay yes. cool anyway number five is narrative positioning oh that's a great one. <laughs> are you just gonna say that about everything on this list they're Probably all good yes. terms. Yeah. I know, right? Um, yeah. So narrative positioning is before you engage the mechanics of a game uh, in whatever game you're playing, what you have done through the narrative that could potentially impact the next rule, mechanism, procedure that you're going to engage. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a decent? Is that I a think decent... so. Yeah. Do you want to do like so? The the example that I can come up with, right, Good. is um, say in um, Powered by the Apocalypse. Um, if you are um, doing a move, there are frequently moves that you can use with different abilities, right? Like depending on how you said you were doing the thing, maybe you're rolling with dexterity. Maybe you're rolling with your strength, right? Whatever it is. Sure. Um, for example, um, so if I'm like, I'm going to stab the goblin. That's not very descriptive. It doesn't have a lot of narrative positioning. But if I say I am going to madly hack at the goblin as hard as I can in a rage, then that's probably like a strength thing. If I say that I'm going to like dodge his blows and like um, sneak in under his armor, that's probably a dexterity thing, right? Like I might, you might, you might ask me to do things based on different abilities, based on how I have narratively described whatever action I'm taking. Sure. I'll give two more examples. Yeah, you can be more Uh, specific than me. 
Um, we so talked I'll, about I'll, how I'll, my brain isn't working, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll name two. I'll do it in two different systems. Okay, uh, do it. Both of them powered by the apocalypse, though. So in Dungeon World, uh, if I say that my paladin gets in front of the wizard um, and engages the goblin. I need, so then if I say that the GM is going to need to ask me, what exactly are you doing? Are you attacking the goblin to kill it or are you protecting the wizard? Mm -hmm. Right? Because both of those have a slightly different narrative uh, positioning. They lead to two separate moves. Two different moves, yeah. Right? So if I'm attacking the goblin to kill it. Well done. If I'm attacking the (laughs) goblin to kill it. Then I'm hack and I'm engaging hack and slash, but if my my goal based on the narrative based on how I'm describing it right so if I say like I I I step in front of the wizard and I you know I slash furiously with my blade to you know to dispatch this goblin as fast as possible that's hack and slash if I step in front of the wizard raise my shield um, and make sh- and, and look over my shoulder and tell the wizard stay behind me that's defend. Mm -hmm. And those have two different mechanisms. I'll give you one more example. In Hydra Hackers, to do the thing you were actually going to say, there is a move called getting the lowdown. The one that you get information. Yeah. If you ask (laughs) around, if you ask people about the move, then you roll plus self, your personality. If you search for it online, you roll plus tech because you were using technology to gather information. Okay. So, narrative positioning is the kind of thing, um, and it's not just PBTA games. We just did three PBTA games. I'll do another one. (laughs) Narrative positioning can be used. So the description that you use, like for instance, um, I bust into the room, I jump up on the table and engage the hobgoblins may get you an advantage role in D&D. Okay? So it's it's the description of what you're doing that then has a mechanical effect in the game. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, the other one, uh, and we did a whole Mr. Dr. Mark show on narrative positioning, but another one might be that you may not be able to do a thing unless your narrative positioning um, creates the opportunity. Right. Right. So, like, I might have to say something like... Um, Oh, my narrative positioning might be like I'm going to uh, I'm going to search along the western wall, uh, looking for anything out of place, and that may be enough to have the GM let me check for um, for a secret passage. Right, right. But if I had said I was check, I was I was you know if I said I was doing uh, I was looking under the rug, right? Then I lack the narrative positioning to find the passage that's on that wall. Right. Okay. That's the more boring version, in my opinion. It's a style of play. (laughs) I know it's not one you like, and it's not one that I do often, but I have played that style, um, and um, it's a little more, it's a bit more OSR-like, and it's okay. Um, It's just, um, to me, sometimes it's a little more Zork than uh, than I like. (laughs) So, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. All right. Next one. Yeah. Cool. Wow. I haven't rolled a single number twice, which is awesome. Okay. Uh, so number three is proactive and reactive. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to you because this is your baby. Uh, yeah. It, so this these two words, we use them actually based on an article that I wrote for Gnome Stool a, a couple of years ago. Um, And we're going to see if my brain can actually generate a coherent description and Phil is going to help me uh, fill in where it doesn't make sense. Right? Cool. Um, So basically, the idea with how we use these two terms is um, proactive being um, actively making the story move forward or making things happen and reactive being um, reacting to what happens in ways that also move the story forward, right? So it's it's an interesting, it's it's one of those things where like um, being proactive tends to be associated with being a GM. Being reactive tends to be associated with being a player because the GM will say, you know, here is a 
10 foot by 10 foot room and there is one torch on the wall, what do you do? Right. And that's a, a very, um, you know, straightforward example of being proactive. Like, here is a thing. How do you react? And the players, you know, might say, I want to pull in the torch and see if it's a secret passage or whatever. Um, but it works in a lot of other really interesting ways as well. So um, part of the reason that we like to talk about this is because um, it is my opinion, and I espoused this in, in the article, which says it much more succinctly and like more clearly than I'm necessarily going to say tonight, because we didn't write any of this down in advance, right? Um so the interesting thing to me is that if we can start defining actions as proactive or as reactive, right, um, then I can tell you that what I like to be in games is reactive, right? So I am both a reactive player in that um, I am not always initiating new content or new story pushes, um, even though I am a certain level of alpha player that is like, you know, trying to, you know, showcase other people at the table, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? You can be an alpha player and still be reactive. You can be a GM and still be reactive, right? My GMing Absolutely. style is reactive in that I like to um, I like to set things in motion and then I like to, as a GM, react to what the players do at the table. And that's actually why... I am not a heavy prep GM because that when I heavy prep my games, it removes the style of GMing that I like to do, which is reactive, which was the thing I had to learn about myself. Um, I don't know. Did that make sense? Phil, what did you, yeah. what did, you did it? Did no, I get it? Did I cover good. it? What kind of GM are you? Um, so it depends on uh, it depends on the game. If I'm playing something more traditional, I tend to be a proactive GM mm -hmm. um, because I feel because the game doesn't actually um, the game doesn't the game, let you do it any other. Well, the way. game doesn't have mechanisms <laughs> for kind of kicking things along. Yeah. So then I will be proactive and I will I will push things along to keep the game to keep the game moving. For something like a PBTA game where the seven to nine move generates so many possibilities and the six minus, um, when it comes up, requires me to react, that's actually... Um, that's actually a game that I'm far more reactive, right? So I will toss, like you, like you said, I will toss something out on the table um, as a problem to get started, and then I will just play off of. Ev I will. It's not even just what the players say. I will play off the roles, right? right. So if a role fails, then I'm gonna I'm gonna react, right? And um, but if I'm running something like New Minera, then no, I'm I'm going to I am going to drive that game a little bit more. And it's interesting because I also think there are some things like um, when when you are doing, um, you know, hard scene cuts for a, a, a convention or something along those lines. Sure. Um, I would also consider that pretty proactive GMing, right? Because you are actually specifically setting and pushing the story along pretty quickly. So I, I will say this. When I am running convention-style games, I am definitely more proactive because mm -hmm. I am actively managing the clock. Yes. When mm -hmm. I am with my home group... Yeah, it's easier uh, to like, be reactive. <laughs> well, like, for my Forbidden Lands game, like, yeah. I'm pretty laid back as a GM. Like, I don't push that game very hard. So however far we get in an evening... I'm just like, yeah, it's cool. Like, we got to wherever we got, and um, yeah, I don't know. I'm I I don't I don't I don't put my foot on the gas as much for that game. I let that I let that game kind of progress uh, more organically. Yeah, so I'll say um, we'll put the link in the show notes to the Gnome Stew article, and we did actually talk about it for a whole entire episode that got like down so far into the weeds that like it. <laughs> It got wild. Um, so if you want to hear more about that, that is a one that you can go back and specifically listen to. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to roll the die again. Are you ready? Yes, please. Bana nope, I already got a four. Bana six. Six is the <gasps> ditch lilies. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Delightful. Who, who are... The di All right, so there's I two definitions. Like, there's yeah, two definitions to this, we to, we and we're to going to do here. both of them, right? Because we've accidentally tricked some people a couple of times. Yes, we're going to do two. We're going to tell you who the ditch lilies are, and then we're going to tell you 
how the ditch lilies came about. Yes. Uh, because <laughs> they are two different things. But the ditch lilies are the greatest 90s um, alt, all-girl band that you have never heard of that we know yes. everything about. Yeah, we are the number one fans of yeah, the I mean, we have been we have been uh, we have been president co presidents of the Ditch Lily fan club uh, for quite some time. Yeah, since the nineties, obviously. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, the Ditch Lilies are uh, uh, four um, four young women in yeah, a I band. Mean, they're getting older now. Well, now, but back in the nineties. Sure. Yeah, we we usually talk about them in the nineties. That was their heyday. Yep. Sure. Um, I, can you name? Oh my can gosh! Can you still name the ditch lilies? <laughs> it's been so long. Well, I'll spot li- you the first one. Lily, 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 obviously. Lily is the lead singer. Yes. Um, and then uh, there Who's is. Who's the drummer? Megan. Yes. <laughs> Megan is the drummer, and she's a mathematical genius. She um, is indeed. Who solves equations actually um, while they're on the road. Um, by just, you know, hitting them in drum patterns. Um, and then uh, there is Michelle. She yes. is the guitarist. Lead guitar, correct. Lead guitar. And um, she's in sports. Yes, she's very sporty. Soccer. She's the sporty spice. Yep. Um, and last. Flames. I- <laughs> Flames. Yes. I can't remember her name. She plays bass. Her name starts with an A. <laughs> Aww. Aww. I'm currently the president of the Ditch Lee Fan Club. <laughs> Not fair. <laughs> it's I, Ashley. You're holding your phone. I bet you looked it up. Aww. I did. did. I wanted to make sure we had them all. <laughs> yeah, there's Ashley. She's the she plays bass. And Mm -hmm. um, she is a fiery redhead who also occasionally, allegedly, allegedly has set some things on fire. Yes. Uh, And the Ditch Lilies uh, spent most of the 90s um, traveling from state, uh, from one um, county fair, state fair to another, playing bars in between. um, And generally um, just being the kind of band that uh, you have a either cassette or some sort of um, home burned uh, CD of that has like a photocopied like insert stuck in a, you know. If You're you even so got great. the plastic case, if you sometimes you just got the CD in a taped piece of paper that you yes. bought like out of the van. Right? Yeah, no, they're um, great. They they did they played Lilith Fair though. Uh, only one time. Uh, only the once, yeah. And then that that tour <laughs> then there bus was, burned. There was allegedly allegedly <laughs> allegedly a tour bus burned down that might have been may or arson. may not have been a may or may not have been arson. Yes. Um, and if you are a fan of obscure 90s bands like the Digital Age, you may also know Vent Magnetic. Vent Magnetic, um, yep. That's that's that, another good one. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so now <laughs> pause for a second. <laughs> okay. The second the, definition. <laughs> the second definition is that the Ditch Lilies are a fictitious band that <laughs> was made up one night in the outtakes of this show <laughs> as we were talking about Texas Blue Bonnets, which I had mentioned is a flower that grows on the side of the road in Texas that you are not allowed to pick because it is a state flower. You are not allowed to pick it even if you see it in the wild. And then you said, having lived in Iowa. Yeah, in Iowa, there's ditch lilies everywhere. And I was like, Ditch Lilies is the most 90s band name (laughs) ever. Which led to us using it as an improv tool for a number of pre-show warm-ups where we started doing Ditch Lily trivia. Yes. Which which is is a... Which is a little improv thing where one of us will say something about the Ditch Lilies and the other one will start to improv um, the situation or story about whatever that event is. Which is how we know things like, you know, burning down vans and stuff. And also, Lily is like absolute disaster by, right? Like, they usually end up leaving town because she fell in love with someone and then she broke up with them. Yes. 
or <laughs> is breaking up with them as she's leaving, as she's leaving or broke up with them on the, the road afterwards. It's band just, yes. is always dating each other and breaking up again. Yes. Yep. Now, because we weren't content enough to just keep improvising <laughs> on the show, we also have in development... Yes. A Ditch Lilies role playing game yes. where you actually play the Ditch Lilies, yes. traveling from town to town, solving problems with queer love and rock and roll. Yes, it's fantastic. And I was actually it. just refreshing myself when I when I held up my phone. I was looking at the character descriptions of them, and it's so good. Like, I just. Yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to a time when the pandemic days end and we go back to developing that game yeah. because it there's so much goodness inside that game that it's is so, like waiting to come out. Yeah, there's so much delightful like just love and music problem solving just waiting to happen there. We we have play tested it. We have play tested it at Metatopia mm-hmm. and it went exceedingly well. Right. There's, I mean, there were tweaky things, but like, yes. And we've talked People, about that, I think, too. But but this yeah. is this is your definition. So if you hear us talking about the ditch lilies, and frequently it will just come up because we'll be like, ooh, pencil sharpener. Oh, yeah, that was like the, wasn't that on like their fifth album or whatever? Like, right. You know, <laughs> just <laughs> Which was also part of our improv routine, right? Like, right. Like, and that still happens. And it happens all the time. It happens to us on Twitter. It happens to us in the Slack room, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So yes. if you see us talking about the ditch lilies, they are not real. Um, no. A couple people have looked them up before they came back to us and were like, in, oh, wait. In our, in our hearts, in our hearts they are real. In our but if you hearts, go to, uh, But if you go to any music website, you will, you will be disappointed. You will not find them. For That's now, true. until we start making fake websites. <laughs> <laughs> when we kickstart this, we're going to have to pay some people to make some music. Yes. That's what's going to happen. We're going to have to zine. like the stretch. The stretch goal is going to be like, and we make a, a, a an album, a Ditch Lilies album, right? Like an actual album. Anyway, should we try and squeeze in one more? Okay. What Although do you got? there's only two left. Do you just want to see if we can get them both? Lightning round. Lightning round. Okay. We're going to go evens. I'll do two and odds. I'll do one in a <laughs> roll to two. Okay. Reading the table. Reading the table. Okay, really quick, in the shortest amount of time possible. Reading the table is the action where a GM, or it could be a player, but often uh, often attributed to a GM, uh, scans the table to look for visual cues of how engaged or not engaged the players are and what is the general mood of the table. Uh, we have talked about this before. It is fraught with problems Mm -hmm. Uh because it relies, it relies on inferring visual, uh, visual cues. And, um, it is at best a flawed system. Um, it is still a tool many of us employ, uh, but it is by no means reliable. And, um, if you, um, uh, I will say this, if you are, um, if you have any problems reading non-visual cues, uh, cues from people then this then reading the table is um completely um either a challenge or unreliable is that yeah. fair yeah 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 um it should never be the only tool that you use to determine no. the enjoyment of your players it is one tool that you can use and should never be the only one how about that you have a whole episode about this yeah. and the short of it is you are far better taking a moment pausing and asking ask. everybody how are we doing <laughs> Yeah. You are way better, but you will hear people say it all the time. Like I'm, I'm reading the table. I'm reading the table. Trust me, reading the table at best is is iffy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Last cool. One? The last one is investment. Oh, I love this one. <laughs> I said that to all of them. Um, you did. You're like, oh, this one's great. <laughs> so investment, we almost always say in terms of emotional investment in a mm-hmm. game, right? So what this means is. Um, what the game does to stir up emotions in us that make us more committed to the game. Yeah, so, it's it's ways that we make ourselves care, even though all of this stuff is fiction, right? Like, mm-hmm. why should I send a... Why should I care about this world that we're playing in? And the answer is that, um, you know, it's, it's all the things... Um, we talk generally about ways to create investment which are ways that we trick ourselves into caring 
about yes. the world and the people in it, right? Yeah, and it's not even, I mean, I don't know if it's trickery as if we're deceiving ourselves, well, but it's more, yeah. like, it's it, more it, like the actions that we do to allow ourselves to feel to emotions things, about this. Things to latch on to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't want to say like we're deceiving ourselves, but for instance, if, um, if you had, um, if you had a girlfriend in a game and then I kidnap her. I this care is a more. Cheesy, right, this, is a, <laughs> this is kind of a cheesy example, but I, I think it gets to the point in the lightning round faster, right? You will care. Yes. Um, I'll about care more her. if you steal um if you steal the barmaid who is my girlfriend, I'll care a lot more than if you steal the barmaid that we all met once. Yeah. Or I never named, right? right. Like, oh the barmaid from the bar was stolen. Oh no. <laughs> but if it's the barmaid oh, that over no. the course of uh, over the course of five or six sessions that you've been flirting with and and have had this kind of like oh are they going to oh nope somebody you know like somebody interrupted them kind of relationship arc the invo- the emotional investment's much higher. Yep. There you go. So, investment. Yeah, so we talk about that a lot when we talk about what is what is like certain activities in games create emotional investment. Yeah, they create those connection points where we can care about the world and the people that's what we want all right well that was the last one see we win win tiger's blood (laughs) winning (laughs) it's been so long you (laughs) wow wow that is old reference that was like old meme territory right there Wow, when when Senda starts making old memes, <laughs> it's time. It must be time for us to end the show. But before we do, Senda, tell us about another show on the Misdirected Mark Network. Oh no! Oh no! Tell us uh, about the Gnomecast. Yeah, I'm going to tell you about the Gnomecast. Um, on the Gnomecast, a bunch of gnomes get together and talk about cool things that we've been writing about. But I'll also tell you that either for 99 or 101, I'm going to be recording a really cool interview. Um, with uh, the folks who uh, edited and compiled and released um, Honey and Hot Wax, which I am very excited to talk to them about um, later this week as we're recording. And um, yeah, so, so, so check it out for that. That's my very specific bespoke plug for the Gnomecast this week because I'm going to be running it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> Say, Sunda. Where do people uh, find us on the internet? Well, you can find us on Twitter at Pandas Talk Games. You can find us in the Misdirected Mark forums, which is forums.misdirectedmark.com. Or you can drop us an email, panda at misdirectedmark.com. And Phil, once they find us in one of those places, what can they do with that information? Yeah, by all means, um, leave us some suggestions for future shows. Um, things that you are curious about that you want us to define, questions you have, uh, techniques you want to hear us talk about doesn't really matter um we're just doing whatever now like we like hanging out with each other and again we would sit around and talk about ditch lily trivia all night <laughs> but if you give us a gaming topic we'll talk about that instead yeah it's fine. um so um so send us something send us what's on your mind uh we really do uh we really do work to pride ourselves on making the show um about the things that you want to hear more than the things that um we want to hear um so we really really like when uh you all give us things questions and things like that uh to work from uh it's it's cool it's fresh and we don't know it's um, sometimes we don't know it's coming till like that day before the day of the recording. So we like yep. that a lot. Yep. Keep it spontaneous. Yep. All right. If you like what we do here elsewhere on the Mr. Rector Mark network, you can support our Patreon campaign. You can go to patreon.com slash MMP patrons of the show. Get all sorts of goodies. Uh, you get the bonus outtakes from the show, which are pretty damn funny. You get the, um, after show for Mr. Rector Mark, which is, well, it just could be anything from, it could just be anything from Bob being grumpy to <laughs> something ridiculous and his- and hilarious. I-, I can't, I can't tell you like it's, it's just whatever rolls off the end of that. Uh, end of that show um you get access to our slack room and this is really this is really the 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 
the key, this is the killer app um, of your patronage. The Slack room is um, a lovely collection of human beings. Um, we have uh, many different uh, chat topics that people can talk about role playing and cooking and uh, what's going on in their lives. And it's just a great place to share things. Uh, we often, in conjunction with that, have a um, Friday luncheon where we all get together on Zoom. Not all of us, but whoever's free can get together on Zoom. Um, we also have, which isn't directly accessed through the Slack room, but if you're part of the Slack community, you'll see the posts for it. Uh, we also have our uh, Star Trek Watch Club, uh, which is now entering the Deep Space Nine uh, phase, um, which is making my heart so big um, because I love <laughs> that show so much. Um, so anyway, um, we really appreciate your patronage. Um it is for us the way to keep everything running. It's our web hosting, our backup costs, our bandwidth, all of that stuff, uh, equipment that um, people need, replacement cables, all of that stuff. All of it is possible uh, because of your generous patronage, and we thank you uh, tremendously for that. If you are uh, already backing the Patreon campaign, which is wonderful, thank you again. And if you are unable to back the Patreon campaign, which is totally fine, we totally understand, especially in these times, there's another thing you can do. doesn't cost a dime. takes a little bit of your time um, that I can't figure out what else to rhyme. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I was trying, but I lost it. Um, but there's you another... still did it. You still did it because... <laughs> <laughs> There's another thing you can do uh, that is actually very helpful for us, uh, and it goes in support of our uh, If You Listen, You Will Love Us campaign, um, which is basically as simple as that. Uh, if, if you listen to us, you'll love us. So besides making your friends and family listen to our podcast, which we greatly appreciate, if you would also do this other thing, it will help strangers find us and also start to listen to us and fall in love with us. What is that thing? You can leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or the podcatcher of your choice. Every new review we get really does actually help those new people, those strangers out there in the world, find our show. Because like algorithms and stuff, it really does help us bubble up to the top, which is great. Um, and we super duper appreciate it. And we super appreciate everyone who has already left a review because they make us super happy and warm and fuzzy inside. It's delightful. <laughs> Indeed it is. Um, and we do appreciate it actually quite a bit. So say Senda, uh, what is your favorite Ditch Lilies album? <laughs> This show is a joint production of She's a Super Geek and Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Bloopy. Alrighty. Uh, Here we are. Got We'd some wave tones. Did the clicky thing. Because I clickied right. I've got some wave tones as I'm looking at you tonight. I don't think I know that song, but I was really enjoying your rendition of it. I don't think I know that song either. I was just making it oh, up. Oh, okay. You're just making it up. It yeah, sounded like a I real just... song, so it was very well done. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I No, just... I had no song in mind. I was just literally I, I was... just... <laughs> It was something I didn't know. No, no, no. That's fair, but uh, no, it's fair. But I was just freestyling. <sighs> it was great. Thanks. It was fantastic. All right, it's been a long day. It's been a long day. We can talk about that a little bit at the beginning. We should like start the show though. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. We should talk about that actually in the post credits. We should get the yeah, show sure. started and rock and roll. Yes. All right. Okay. Are you ready? Uh -huh, I'm going to count us. I'm going to count us to 10, but only with one hand. Bloop. Boom. Boom. Do, 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 do